Now Nikon searched in vain through the mangled corpses for the body so that he could bury the two in the family plot at the local cemetery. He placed his family's remains alongside his grandmother's burial site. They were among the few Armenians to receive a formal funeral. Twenty-four other members of his extended family rotted in unmarked graves somewhere in the Ottoman Empire, perhaps killed swiftly with a blow from an axe, or perhaps the victims of a slow death. In all, the Ottoman Empire slaughtered one and a half million Armenians and evicted 500,000 more from lands inhabited for 2,500 years. The tragedy would come to be known as the Armenian Genocide. <clears throat> the reason I started the book with that scene and why I read it here is because Gurgen Yanikian's tale comes at a flashpoint in the post-genocide story. But it also, he symbolizes the two things that are unique to the Armenian experience. Uh, unlike any other genocide of the 20th century, the Armenian genocide, which was very well known while it was taking place, disappeared from the world's consciousness. And that's something unique to the Armenian experience. And of course, I'm sure all of you know about Turkish denial. Uh, where the perpetrators not only got away with their crime, but came to deny the very existence of that crime. And Yanikan was, was responding uh, to these two challenges. Now, I'm going to have a few articles here. They're all from 1915, and they're the headlines uh, from the New York Times. And this first one says, Morgenthau intercedes, and this is from the spring of 1915. Uh, Morgenthau was an the U.S. ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. And soon after, the Young Turks rounded up Armenian leadership in April 1915. He went to them and he tried to intervene on their behalf. Obviously, it was to no avail. The next article talks of wholesale massacres. Then we have an extinction. And then we get into the body counts. 500,000 Armenians and then 800,000 Armenians. In fact, in 1915 alone, the New York Times had more than 100 articles describing the genocide. And every major newspaper in the United States talked about this issue. Now, the genocide inspired the first ever major international humanitarian aid movement. We remember the tsunami from a couple of years ago. Uh, people from across the world sent money to uh, victims in Asia. And when I was a child in the 1980s, it was the Ethiopian famine, and Americans sent money abroad, and the, the pop singers like Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie created the We Are the World song. But well before all of these campaigns, the Armenians were the first, first beneficiaries of a major international humanitarian aid movement. And the United States was at the forefront of this effort. In fact, the United States sent $116 million of aid and four to 5,000 American relief workers administered uh, refugee camps and orphanages throughout the Middle East. Now that 160 million is about a billion and a half in today's terms, just to give you an idea of how unprecedented that was, considering there was no example to build on. Now ultimately, uh, this effort culminated in an institution called the New East Foundation, and this is one of their posters one of their fundraising posters. And these posters were plastered throughout the United States. And remember, this is the age before the internet, television, and radio. So they often had posters like these and newspaper ads to raise money. And the New East Foundation served as a model for the USAID and the Peace Corps decades later. Now, in order to raise money, they relied on um, iconic images that would be popular to Americans. So here you have a Lady Liberty protecting an Armenian girl, and you have Uncle Sam. Now, this was a real grassroots effort in the United States. Uh, proceeds from the 1916 Harvard-Yale football game went to Armenian-related charities. In 1917, 30,000 American Sunday schools raised a million dollars. And of that 116 million, 25 million came from the U.S. government. Now, this humanitarian effort was also the first time that celebrities were used to raise money for such a charitable effort. Uh, the boy sitting next to Charlie Chaplin is a boy named Jackie Coogan, and he was a silent film star in the 1920s. 
And later on in life, he went on to play uh, Uncle Fester in the Adams Family. But in the 1920s, he led what was called the Milk Campaign. And he would urge children who came to the theater to watch his movies to, build, to bring uh, cans of condensed milk, which were then shipped abroad to Armenian orphans. So you had this massive humanitarian effort, but you also had a great deal of political advocacy in the United States. So what were they advocating for? Well, after World War I, the Ottoman Empire was among the defeated powers in World War I. And the victors of the war, the United States, Great Britain, France, uh, they were determining what to do uh, with the empire. And the Armenians had gone asking for reparations, uh, trials of the perpetrators of the genocide, as well as the establishment of a homeland. Now, a lot of this advocacy was done here in the United States. And this is an event in February 1919. It's a gala uh, at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. Uh, anyone familiar with that hotel? It's on the corner of Fifth Avenue and Central Park. It's still there. And so at this event, there were 400 people in attendance. The humanitarian aid workers, the people raising money for the Armenians, as well as the political advocates got together in this event. And the keynote speaker was Charles Evans Hughes. Now, few people have had a more accomplished career in American politics than Hughes. Already in 1919, at the time of this event, he was the governor of New York, justice of the Supreme Court, and the 1916 Republican presidential candidate. In the 1920s, he became Secretary of State, and in the 30s, he became Chief Justice. And he was the chairman of this advocacy committee, uh, pushing for the reparations and the homeland and all those things that the Armenians wanted after World War I. And he was the keynote speaker at this event. <coughs> now, President Woodrow Wilson couldn't attend. The First Lady and his children attended, but he couldn't attend because he was in Paris overseeing the peace talks, the post-World War I peace talks. But he sent a telegram to one of the organizers vowing to also support the Armenians. And you have to think about how odd this is, right? Wilson and Hughes were political opponents in the 1916 presidential race. But on this issue, on the issue of the Armenians, they spoke with one voice. Now, who else was there? Uh, the people in attendance were the who's who of America's industrial, political, and cultural elite. Uh, William Taft, former president, attended, as did Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge, both of whom became president in the 1920s. John Rockefeller was there, and he was among the first and largest donors to Armenian-related charities. Uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, William Randolph Hearst, Clarence Darrow, and even F. Scott Fitzgerald. They were all there to support the Armenians. Now this is a quote by President Herbert Hoover from his memoirs. And it kind of uh, is the culmination of everything I've spoken about in the last couple of minutes. And he wrote in his memoir, probably Armenia was known to the American school child in 1919 only a little less than England. And just imagine that. That's not something you could say today. Right? Even with all the mass media and the fact that there's a country of Armenia, you couldn't say that today. But in 1919, the Armenian plight and the Armenian genocide was something that was commonly known throughout the United States. So, as I said earlier on, one of the profound mysteries of the Armenian experience is how do you go from this quote by Hoover to this one uttered 20 years later by Hitler? And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this quote. Uh, this was made on the eve of World War II, and Hitler ordered his army to be ruthless and show no mercy, even to women and children. And for anyone who doubted the wisdom of his command, he told them, who after all speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? And he was right. Soon after all that activity, the humanitarian effort, the political advocacy, uh, the world moved on and quickly forgot